Ciolo. I am the uh, Magnolia Stewart um, Associate Professor of History here at MIT. Uh, this is a chair in Women in the Developing World. One of my responsibilities is to organize this biannual lectures, which is on a topic that pertains to the women in the developing world. By developing world, we mostly have been interpreting as Middle East and North Africa. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have Professor uh, Suat Joseph with us from University of California. Uh, Davis. 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 Sorry, <laughs> there are many of you in University of California, <laughs> where she has been teaching since uh, 76, if I remember, 1976. She is a prominent scholar of uh, Middle East studies in general, the modern Middle East, specifically women in the Middle, Middle East, women's and gender uh, studies. She is an anthropologist, professor of anthropology and gender, sexuality, and human studies. Um, her work has revolved around the questions of state, family, kinship networks, selfhood, and politicization of ethnic and religious difference. Uh, theoretically grounded work has uh, situated notions of self, rights, citizenship, in the context of different political regimes and in the context of the pressures and processes of globalization. Um, she began, Dr. Uh, Joseph began her career uh, focusing on her native Lebanon, but now the, um, for a long time the coverage has extended to the whole region um, that we call the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so her CV is about 40 pages. That's mm -hmm. why I'm not, I'm mm -hmm. going to, I have to keep this short. Many of you already are either familiar with her work or know her. Uh, you are very lucky to have a group of family members here in this room that came from different parts of this uh, coast to be with us. Thank you and welcome. Um, so I'm just going to list a few of the books that she published and some of her um, I think activism in academia in terms of founding institutions and organizations and building networks within academia itself. Uh, many of us are very familiar with the Encyclopedia of Human and Islamic Cultures, which she is the main editor of, uh, which includes um, various volumes, I think six volumes in total. Yes. Um, she has edited or co-edited eight books and published over 100 articles. Um, some of the names of the edited books are, but just the titles, I'm just going to read the titles, Muslim Christian Conflicts, Economic, Political and Social Origins. Uh, one of the earlier ones is Building Citizenship in Lebanon. Another one is Gender and Citizenship in Lebanon. Um, then there's one that's published in 2000, which is the book that I got to learn about your work. Gender and Citizenship in the Middle East, that's one thing that we read in our general class at MIU, graduate school. Um, intimate, there's another one titled Intimate Selling in Arab Families, Self and Identity. Um, a 2001 book is titled Women and Power in the Middle East. And there's another one titled Phoenix, Rethinking Arab Family uh, Projects. Currently, she is engaged in various different uh, projects, and one of them that is connected to the previous one, but seems to be going also towards another direction, is analyzing that analyzes the representation of Arabs, Muslims, Arab American, and Muslim American in major American print news media. She is the founder of the Middle East Research Group in Anthropology, which evolved into the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association. Um, Dr. Joseph is also the founder of the Association for Middle East Women's Studies, which is a significant institution with various different resources for us who do women in the Middle East. Um, she is also the founder of the Arab Families Research Group, which I've talking about. In the past, she served as the president of the Middle East Studies Association, and she's co-founder and founding president of the Arab American Studies Association, and co-founder of the Association uh, for Middle East Anthropology. So without further ado, thank you for being here, and welcome. Thank you so much. OK, 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the technology is working. Well, first, I want to thank MIT, but especially to thank Professor Lerner at McGrew and uh, for inviting me for for the Macmillan Stewart Professorship, and especially to th also to thank Emily Neal who did so much of and Sophie. Uh, Hassenfuss, who did mo so much of the organiza organizational work, uh, they had to deal with many ins and outs of my family, which uh, was they did with great uh, patience and uh, and understanding. But I'd also would like to acknowledge my family because this this project is about family. The talk is about family, and I've spent the past several decades of my uh, scholarly life talking, uh, doing research about my family. And there's my sister-in-law Patty. Raise your hand, uh, Joseph, Michael. Uh, her son, Michael, and Azili, his wife, Joseph, and then uh, Cammie, raise your hand, Cammie, and Alex, their children, and my niece, Michelle, who is my old best friend, good friend, uh, great friend, actually, is the term, and her daughter, Paige, and Jana uh, Looney. Um, it means so much to me that you came all the way from, a couple of them came all the way from Pittsfield, several hours away. To, to hear their, their aunt and uh, sister-in-law talk. I also want to acknowledge some dear, dear friends uh, who traveled various distances to come. Zaina Zatari, uh, um, former student and director of the Political Research uh, Associates, and dear, dear friend Efsani Najmabadi from uh, Harvard, and uh, Leila Ahmed, I think, has not found her way here yet, but I think she's trying desperately. So thank you for dear friends. And Rochelle Taku, one of my oldest friends. Where's, where's Rochelle? Okay. Graduate student buddies from way, way back. Um, and I want to tell you that my talk is all written out already here for you. <laughs> so I'm just going to start with the Q&A if you're ready to ask questions. <laughs> OK. So why family? Let's, let's, uh, in the midst of what's going on in the Arab region, one can rightly ask, why talk about families? Let's look at what's going on in the Arab region. There's the Arab Spring of 2011 and the, few, the very disastrous uh, fallouts from those uprisings, the ongoing occupation of Palestine, failed wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the collapse of Syria, the dire situation of the displaced Syrians, the stumbling new nations of Sudan that split into two countries, four decades long instability of Lebanon, the re-installment uh, re, uh, uh, of the military in Egypt after the failed uprisings there in 2011, the ongoing bloodbath in Libya, the relentless suppression of protests in Yemen and Bahrain, the rise of the Islamic State. Uh, these are images that you see constantly in the news uh, today. So you can rightly ask the question, with all of this going on in the Arab region, how can someone, how can we as a scholarly community focus uh, the, the, our limited time on the so-called domestic sphere? The sphere of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts grandparents and cousins, generational conflict, family decision making, family structures of power, gender relations, masculinities, femininity, sexualities, domestic service. How can, we, how can we in good conscience spend time talking about these things when there is so much turmoil that is going on in, the, uh, in that region and which headlines so much of the newsprint that you see? And I have one answer to that, and that is we cannot afford to not focus on family, which is why you've got this in front of you. I'll tell you a little bit more about this. There's not an event, not a social, political, economic, religious, cultural event uh, unfolding in the Arab region today which is not relevant to families and for which the a more rigorous analysis of the families would not help us understand those critical uh, uh, events. Family remains the most powerful social idiom in the Arab region. To mobilize love of nation, national movements narrate the nation as a family. To moralize and motivate their own following, political leaders use family idioms, positioning themselves as fathers or mothers and brothers and sisters to their clients and their parties or their states. To stimulate production, economic actors evoke the sense of duty and mutual commitment of family uh, to, to their workers. To sanctify their edicts, Clerics wrap religion in the moralities of family and family in the moralities of religion. 
Even civil society organizations are often organized as family or family-like shops throughout the region. To call someone family is to offer them almost the highest possible intimacy, loyalty, rights, reciprocities, and dignity. Yet despite four decades of feminist research on the Middle East and North Africa, and despite the intensive work of the Arab Families Working Group that uh, was mentioned earlier, which I founded in 2001, nevertheless, rigorous work is still needed to theorize and understand family in the Arab region. To address this need for a better understanding family, the argument I'm going to be making is that you can't really do research on the Arab region without knowing the way in which family operates. Uh, whether it's you're talking about the economy or you're talking about politics, or you're talking about religion, you have to understand the way the family is organized. And by the way, I wouldn't hesitate to make that argument about many other regions of the world as well. I don't think the Middle East or the Arab region is unique in this regard. But in order to to, to try to bring scholarship more to the, on the Arab families, more to the attention of the scholarly community, I assembled this book that you've got the flyer uh, on. It's a country-by-country -country review of the literature over the past half century on Arab families, plus uh, additional some chapters that are thematic uh, chapters. Uh, what we try to do is, is do a thorough analysis of what we know what we don't know, how we came to know it, meaning what theoretical approaches and what methodological approaches were used to study family, who did the studies, on what countries did they do the studies, and what did we learn from them. Such analyses, I think, provide acute insights not only to the state of scholarship on families, but also the state of sociological, uh, the, the state of sociological scholarship in the region in general. So what I want to do today is draw attention to some of the themes, some of the issues that came out when we assembled uh, what turns out to be about 25 chapters, 25 scholars from around the world to uh, do reviews, critical reviews of the literature. Uh, the, a theme, uh, I decided to organize the chapters country by country because of a theme that you'll see me talking about throughout this presentation, which is what I think is the critical relationship between family and state. I think you cannot understand the state without understanding family. You can't understand family without understanding the state. Uh, it, <clears throat> many of the Arab countries are rel uh, relatively new in terms of their geographies, their boundaries, post-World I or post-World War II. <clears throat> with the fall of the, em of the Ottoman Empire, the British and the French basically divided up much of that region among each other. Uh, and it was uh, many of these countries uh, gained independence post-World War II. Uh, as a result of that occupation, you've got the Ottoman Empire, you've got the French, and you've got the, the British occupation in those areas. Many of the laws that, we'll, that we are looking at that, that affect gender, or that affect family, were actually inherited or adapted from British or Ottoman or, or uh, French um, uh, colonial history. So uh, family law, which is one of the most important areas that we'll, get, we'll talk about today, is very uh, critically related to citizenship laws, and many of these in particular family law and citizenship laws uh, have uh, shared traces of the Ottoman, British, and French uh, administrative management. Although, of course, they've, they've gone through many uh, reforms uh, send th since then. In the process of producing uh, this volume, uh, it was instructive uh, to, for me to uh, look at what, what is the state of scholarship uh, now. For almost every author who I invited to do a, a chapter in this book, uh, uh, I, I received a complaint from them. And the complaint was, there's not enough research for us to review, which was rather stunning statement, given that we've had, as I said, four decades of research on gender and, uh, and family in the region. Some of the authors said, oh, don't bother even covering this country. There's not enough to make it worthwhile to put a chapter uh, um, dedicated to, this, to Arab families in this particular country. Um, the, uh, the, what I tried to do is get them to organize their chapters so that they focused on what are the scholarly paradigms that were used to study these countries. That's, re that's that the reason for th that this is important is that the, the paradigm that you use uh, affects what you think of as research, affects what you think of as scholarship, and affects the kind of data you're likely to get. So we, we asked them to organize their research around the, the scholarly paradigms and the methodologies that were, that were used. 
So they did a very rigorous, there was a lot of going back and forth. They would say, we want to do this. And I'd say, no, I want you to do that. I mean, as, as always there is in a, in a book, an edited book. But as I read their articles, once they produced the, their, their chapters, they were incredibly well written, very thoughtful. But one of the things that came through repeatedly to me, chapter after chapter, was how is it, after so much time, that there is so little work that is problematizing and theorizing one of the most critical institutions in Arab society today, which is the, f the family. A number of reasons might come to mind as to why there isn't as much theorizing work on Arab families. One is that there's an overwhelming emphasis on Islam. There's a prejudice toward the study of religion in the study of the Middle East in general and the Arab uh, world in particular. So that scholarly privileging of, of Islam especially intensified after the Iranian Revolution in 1979. It, 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 the kind of Middle East kind of became about Islam for not only the popular media, but also for, for scholarship. That's one reason. Another reason that there is uh, less research on Arab families, or less theorizing, I should say, about Arab families, as one would expect, given the importance of the institution, is that other topics were considered more prestigious, like oil. You get, you're much more likely to get a job if you're studying oil than if you're studying families, uh, or labor, or, or politics. Uh, and I can testify how in the 1980s and 1990s, I tried numerous times to create, simply to create a panel at the Middle East Studies Association of Scholars who were doing research on Arab families. And year after year, I would fail to e simply a, a assemble a panel uh, of, of people to uh, present um, their research. But a third factor, and I think this is the one that for me is the most telling and most interesting, uh, of why there may not be more theorizing about the fam Arab family, is that it is assumed to be already known. We are already there, we know what it is, and it's taken for granted. And I would like to suggest that that's a very naive assumption. It's a vacuous and at times a dangerous assumption to assume that we already know what the family is. The family is the elephant in the room. It goes unnoticed because it's so big. It's a thing you don't talk about because you think you're already talking about it. Um, uh, it, but, but in fact, it shapes it is shaped, shapes and is shaped by economies, labor forces, political realities, market conditions, consumption patterns, population dynamics, social reform, social movements, global transformations, the circulation of, of cultures and technologies. All of those are affected by family and family affects them. And I will touch on examples of all of these in the talk today. But especially given the instability and the weakness and the repressiveness of so many of the states in the region, or the limited capacity or the limited political will of the states to serve or protect their citizens, family becomes a primary unit of political and economic security in the region. Families serve as the primary mediators between their members and the states, as well as their members and the marketplace and civil society. Families are first, and at times they are the only resource for economic well-being, uh, especially in these economies that are battered by global fluctuations and political upheaval. Families are the bedrock of identity and loyalty. Who you are is about who your family is. Uh, and family channels uh, is a pathway toward religion. You tend to be the religion of your, your family. So there's all of these things loop back to family. Unequivocally, the production of families in the Arab region is foundational. Uh, to the production of Arab societies. I would make that argument. We cannot ignore, in this most critical moment of regional transformation, rigorous study of Arab families, particularly in relationship to families and states. But the first thing we have to do is to clarify what it is that we're talking about. What is this thing that we call the family? And I would call for a, uh, um, intensive thinking to clarify our concepts. There are many Arabic terms that could be used to describe family. Al-Aili, Al-Usra, Al-Ahl, Al-Ashira, al qurayb The Western term family can be translated in many, many different ways. But so the term family does not act adequately capture all the many things under which family uh, circulates in the Arab region. The term family, in fact, I would argue is a straitjacket to, un to our capacity to understand the complexities of families uh, in the uh, Arab region. Uh, as problematical and, uh, uh, as the uncritical application of the term family to 
um, this diverse array of social arrangements is also Western theories of family. We tend to understand Arab families through Western theories of family. Especially problematical are psychological, psychodynamic, and psychoanalytical theories which have been applied to Arab families. They're developed in a specific Western historical context to, and, and locations. And when they're applied uncritically to other regions of the world, uh, especially the Arab, Arab region, uh, I think they misrepresent or misconstrue the dynamics of relationships uh, in uh, the, those countries. Um, it's not an accident, for example, that psychology is one of the least developed disciplines in the Arab region. I, I think there's very good reason for that. Lots of political science, even sociology, lots of history, but psychology is nowhere near as well developed a discipline. And, um, Perhaps one of the so that uh, so one of the problem is that we tend to use terms like family and assume that we meaning the same thing when uh, that is as the terms in Arabic. Another problem is that we tend to use Western theories to understand uh, non-Western societies. That's not specific to the Arab region. We tend to do that in, in anthropology and sociology and political science. We just globalize our our theoretical uh, toolkit. Another re, uh, problem in specifically Arab, uh, the study of Arab families is that we tend to apply one of the frameworks that was developed in feminist theory uh, and, and has been highly criticized in feminist theory more recently, but we, it, it's amazing how long it's lingered in the study of the Arab region, which is a gendered notion of public-private domains. This is a theory that emerged in political, economic, and sociological, even psychological and gender theory. And the assumption of this notion of a binary between public and private domains is that the societies are universally divided into the more powerful public sphere and the less powerful uh, a private sphere and that the public sphere is associated with masculinity and the private sphere is associated with femininity and that the family somehow is located in that private sphere. Despite the fact that there's probably two decades if not more of feminist criticism of that notion when applied to Western societies, it somehow still emerges when we're studying the uh, Arab societies. I, I, and I think one of the reasons that it still emerges is that we tend to have a culturalist approach to the studying the Arab region. And what I mean by cultural uh, as approach is that we tend to look at them in terms of just their cultures rather than their economies and their politics and their state organization and so forth. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's also a, hang, a holdover from uh, Orientalist approaches which tended to look at the region mainly through a cultural lens. Um, the idea that there is a specific Arab culture or a specific Arab family is just downright uh, misrepresented. It, it, it just isn't the case. There isn't a specific Arab culture or a specific Arab family. There's a diversity of cultures, a diversity of family forms. And when we apply that notion that throughout the Arab world there's this public-private domain and, and families operate in this way or, or cultures operate in, this, in some other way, we are misrepresenting. So there is uh, a, another uh, obstacle that, that, we, that I have found in uh, gender studies as applied to family studies in the Arab region, uh, which is a conflation of family with women. We tend to, when we think of family studies, we think it's all about women. And also, the confl just as we tend to conflate the study of gender with, with, with women. Uh, forgetting that there are men in the families and that there are children in the families. In fact, men sometimes disappear in family studies. And I have argued through much of my work that the men are critical to understanding uh, family studies in the Arab region and any place in the world. This is, again, not unique. But for some reason, family studies are often focusing particularly on women. Uh, so what we need is what, we, what is now called in a more intersectional approach, looking at uh, uh, all the members of the uh, units that we're looking at uh, and looking at them through the lenses of, of race, class, gender, ethnicity, religion, and so forth. Uh, another concept, we're still talking about how do we clarify our concept, another concept that has been, uh, that has tripped up a lot of us uh, in studying Arab families is the concept of patriarchy. The, it's, it's tripped up a lot of people studying uh, family systems in this country and in Europe and other places because we tend to think there is a specific thing that patriarchy is and that we know what that thing is. Uh, but again, that concept has, uh, uh, a word had to be invented in Arabic for it because it didn't, it, it didn't exist uh, in, in Arabic. Uh, <coughs> uh, and it's called abawi, uh, which is mainly like the fatherhood uh, syndrome. 
Um, but uh, it, patriarchy, as it's used in most Western feminist literature, is about gender inequality and gender hierarchy. Uh, and, and it's not that we don't have gender inequality and gender hierarchy in the in Arab family systems, in the plural, but it's, that it's much more nuanced than that. It's also age-based, meaning that elder women uh, are often very, very powerful, uh, elder sisters, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, so I, I think that, it's, it, in other words, it's much more densely kin-based than the way in which patriarchy tends to be used in some of the uh, literature that we, we read here. Um, also, I think that to understand patriarchy there or understand uh, the gender hierarchies there uh, and age hierarchies there, one has to understand them in the context of the failure of states. That to, the, to a large degree, many of the states in the region have failed to serve their own citizens with social services, with political protection, with stability, with uh, jobs, uh, with health conditions, and so forth. So when, when, when that happens, when, the, when you don't have public alternatives, who do you turn to? The main places you turn to tend to be family. There's another resource that we'll talk about in a minute, which happens to be religious movements. So, so, uh, so uh, what I would suggest is that we have to be very careful about clarifying the concepts that we're looking at when we're studying uh, Arab families and that we don't just uncritically apply concepts that work very well in one place but may, may or may not work so well in another place. Uh, that is, that the social arrangements that we recognize uh, here uh, may not look the same uh, in and the, uh, the effort to make, to make a congruence between the categories that we're familiar with here and these uh, actual social arrangements we, we see on the ground has a tendency to essentialize families. That is to assume that they're all uh, the same thing. Uh, and I want to give you an example uh, to, to kind of trouble your mind. And if I, could, if I were as good at writing formulas as whoever preceded us here, I would write it out on, on the board. But let me just li perk up your ears and listen to this. And it's a question of how do we know a family is a family? How do we know a household is a household? At what point do you draw a line in knowing, okay, this is the family and this is something else. So listen carefully to this example. And this is true. This is an example that from my field work uh, that I've been carrying on since 1994, doing a longitudinal study of children in this one village uh, that happens to be the village I was born in, uh, uh, and in which the, uh, there's a, a tendency for now for uh, parents to build homes that are multiple stories and each floor goes to a son. The son gets married and so the brothers are living together and occasionally a floor is uh, given to a daughter uh, as well. So, uh, and, and in, this store, in, in this case, in this village, uh, there's one building that I'm gonna call Building A uh, that has four stories with one apartment on each floor. The four apartments include the parents and their adult sons, who are all married and all of them have children. They spend an enormous amount of time together in each other's apartments and socializing, sharing meals, uh, childcare, and financial responsibilities. Next door is building, I'm gonna call it just building B, that has three floors. And, and the, uh, the building belongs to three sons of the elder brother that built building A. So building A and building B were built by two brothers. The, this was their parents' property. So building A is built by one brother, building B is built by his younger brother, and they each built a store, a, a floor for each of their, uh, in this case, their sons. So that means that everyone in this building is related to everybody in that building, right? Okay. So it gets, it gets more interesting. Listen very carefully. So, um, during my research period, which is 1994 to the present, only one of the apartments in Building B was, uh, was continued occupied by one of the sons. The oldest son had migrated to the United States, and the youngest son lived temporarily in his uh, oldest, son, uh, oldest brother's apartment in Building B. Then he moved to his parents' house in a nearby town. So the, the adult males in Building A are all brothers. And the adult males in Building B are all brothers. And the adult males in Building A are all first cousins, because their fathers are brothers, right? Uh, so they're all related. In Building A, the owners of the building live on the bottom floor. So the brother who built it, that house, he lives on the first floor um, on, on, uh, with his wife. Uh, 
uh, on the second floor of building A, the male household head is married to the, listen to this, the mother's, his mother, who lives downstairs, his, his mother's sister's daughter. So his first cousin by his mother. His mother-in-law, therefore, is also his aunt, his mother's sister. The husband and the wife on the second floor share their, uh, um, also have the same grandparents. In fact, their grandfather, who happened to be a priest, married them. So it's quite a family affair. The wife's mother, who is also the aunt of the, of the husband, is constantly visiting and spending time. Her sister's downstairs, her daughter and son-in-law, who happens to also be her nephew, are upstairs, and so she's up and down, up and down the stairs. She'll come and sit for a little while with her sister, they have coffee or whatever, and then she's, I'm gonna go upstairs now, and she sits with her daughter and her son-in-law, who's also her nephew, and then her grandchildren are, are there. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the male household head of the, that apartment on floor two is also, as I said, the cousin of the, of the men who live in uh, the building B, right? Well, one of the men who lives in building B and this male household head in, in the second floor of building A co-own a, a, a building right next door to them that belonged to their grandmother. And she decided not to divide, she decided to give it to her two sons, uh, uh, that is the builders of building A and building B. And the two sons decided to give it to this son over here and this son over here. So now third generation removed, they own property together, figure out how they're going to divide it. It's one building, and it's basically one room and a bathroom. Um, so they, they co-own, and they've decided not to subdivide. They're just, they're just holding on to it. Um, OK. Uh, and, and so that's their shared grandparents, by the way. In building A, on, on the third floor, the male household, me, me, the male household head who's again, the brother of the one who lives on the second floor and the son of the ones who live on the first floor and the cousin of the ones who lives in building B happens to be married to the sister of the one who lives in building B. They saw each other visiting at each other's houses and aha, something happened and all of a sudden they're married. So we've got not only the men are brothers, but their wives are, are sorry, the men now are cousins, but the wives are, are sisters. In building A, uh, the male household head is unrelated to his wife. Uh, but he's, the, he's a cousin, of course, to all of the men in building uh, B. Now, is this a Muslim family or is this a Christian family? You said the priest. Oh, I gave it away. Oh, no. Oh, no. You're listening too closely. <laughs> I asked. I did. And you did. You obeyed. What a good, good audience you are. So this was a pattern you would expect of what? A Muslim? You would expect it as a pattern. No, this is a Christian family. It's a, and it's a Greek Orthodox Christian family. Actually, they're, they're, they're mixed. They're, they're Greek Orthodox. They're uh, Baha'i, of all things. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting combination. Um, but the village is overwhelmingly a Christian village. And this is not a unique story. It's a very common story in this village uh, for cousins to marry uh, and for neighbors to marry. So the question that I would pose to you, what is the family? Is it the whole building? Is it the two buildings together? Is it just each floor? Where's the family? They're sharing meals. They're sharing finances. One of the, one of the men works for his brother. The other man works for his, his uncle. Uh, the father is still financing the, the brother, uh, the, the, the son on the third floor, who ended up migrating to Montreal shortly after I began this re research project. Uh, where do you draw the lines? That's the, that's the question that I think is fascinating because we tend to want to create boundaries when we do our social analysis. We wanted to create units of analysis so we know what we're talking about. And what I'm suggesting is that units of analysis that we're used to creating and like to create and that help us to, to develop explanatory models may not be as useful here that we need to see much more fluidity, much more flexibility, much more complexity when we look at families. So we can't assume that the term family or families mean the same unit of analysis or action over, over time whether it's in one place or one country, and that in fact these are highly complex institutions, and it's, you need on-the-ground analysis to uh, understand them, and you need to clarify your concepts uh, so that we know that uh, what it is that you're uh, that you're actually studying. So, what what makes an Arab family an Arab family? Is it simply because they speak Arabic? 
uh, when I teach a course on the, on the Middle East and I try to define what is, what is the Middle East, uh, you know, first of all, you start with the fact that that term was coined by a British naval officer and not by the, the Middle Eastern people themselves. But you try to define what is Arab, and you, go, you, you end up going around in a circle. Is it the language? Do they have, all have the same culture? Is it Islam that unifies them? Is it uh, that they, large numbers of them were under one political system at one point in time? I mean, it's, it's not an easy uh, answer. But then uh, you, uh, you can ask yourself, I think, well, what makes a Hispanic a Hispanic, right? What makes a Latino a Latina, right? Is, it, is, there, is there a pure set of blood characteristics that characterize them? Is there this pure uh, set of, uh, 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 of um, uh, language? Is, are they Native American? Are they Hispanic? Are they, is there African American? Where, where do you draw the lines? I think, I think a lot of our categories, which are very soothing in some way when we talk about uh, 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 diversity are also problematical at, a, at another level. Okay. Uh, so what I would suggest that in any region of the world that has, has, has had as many rises and falls of empires, movements of people uh, uh, across uh, uh, the, the, the whole region and from other regions into it, we have such a different mix of languages, religions, and ethnicity. Uh, that, uh, that uh, we, we have to uh, uh, sharpen our concepts. In fact, uh, uh, the one study that I think has is, is, uh, been not, not as attended to as much as it, it should be is a wonderful study by Jack Goody, which is, a from my point of view, a classic discussion of marriage and family in Europe. And what he argued is that the family in Europe, up to a certain point, uh, uh, in southern Europe, up to a certain point, rep was closer to the North African family than it was to the Northern European family. That changes occurred after the rise of, and consolidation of the Catholic Church, and in which, which systematically went about trying to change the family system in Europe. It's a wonderful book. Um, Jack Goody, 1983. Um, so I would suggest then that the term Arab family is a large tent, to use that local term, under which we, we, uh, we house many, many different meanings, and that it's a lively and robust conversation for, for scholars to, uh, to look and examine at the concept of the family in a more critical uh, way. Okay, so let's look to some of the thematics that came up. So that was simply about clarifying concepts and being very attuned to the diversity that exists on the ground that you will miss if you just use concepts that you're familiar with and that seem to have theoretical resonance uh, here but may not have empirical re resonance uh, in other places of the world. One of the big themes that came up, and it's a theme that is very important in my own research, but came up systematically in all of the uh, scholars' work in, that, was, that uh, was compiled in this book, is the relationship between families and state, states. Uh, Denise, Denise Candioti's early work highlights for us the importance of the relationship between kinship structures and the state. In her edited book, Women, Islam, and the State, she guided her co contributors to interrogate state projects. And she argued, quote, the unifying argument of this volume is that an adequate analysis of the position of women in Muslim societies must be grounded in a detailed examination of political projects of contemporary states and their historical transformations. I think that is as true today as it was two decades ago when she uh, uh, made that statement. Uh, I suggest that families and states together are the most crucial units of sociality in the uh, Arab region and perhaps in, in other regions as well. Uh, I don't do Europe, so I can't talk about that. Uh, but this is particularly so in the Arab region, which has the earliest and longest history of state formation of any region of the world. That 5,000 plus year history of state formation means that state-level organizations have penetrated into every area of social action. Uh, the history of this region often consists of mapping the rise and fall of states and empires and the characteristics of those states. Uh, and in, in recognition of the centrality uh, of the states to understanding women uh, and, and gender in this region, my editorial board for the uh, print edition of the Encyclopedia of Women in Islamic Cultures uh, decided to dedicate the whole first volume of the encyclopedia to a historical analysis of how different states shaped scholarly production on women and Islamic cultures, regime by regime, uh, region by region. And in fact, it was Dr. F. Sine Najmabadi's idea that we do this, and she uh, uh, helped us through that process of 
doing that historical analysis of making sure that we were always attentive to what the state projects were and what political projects were shaping women and gender relations. Families are central to state formation. No state designs itself without considering state st structures of families available to it and the structures of states of families that they need uh, for their uh, state building projects. Every state plans for families as a critical unit in its social, economic, and political reproduction of their societies. It's no accident that the constitutions of most of the Arab states declare the family is the basic unit of society and not the individual. Uh, it should be noted that states and families, can uh, neither of them can be seen as bounded units or as single actors. Families and states constantly impinge on each other, uh, yet they ne don't necessarily encompass each other. So they're, while they're in relationship to each other, cannot be studied apart from each other, they are not coterminous with each other. The historical relations between families and states in the Arab region are particularly un, uh, understudied, as I've, I've mentioned. State regimes have worked to shape family structure. Uh, they've worked to shape the authority within the family. They've worked to shape men and women's roles and the control over children and youth through their legislation and through their political practices, especially through family law, which regulates marriage, inheritance, child custody. But state management of such things as the economies, the markets, transportation, trade, <coughs> state boundaries, the circulation of goods, all of those affect uh, labor, consumption patterns, and families. I've argued in the past, and I would do so again, that in some ways it's very interesting to argue that in some ways the fa states invent the families that they need. And what I mean by that is they are constantly trying to transform uh, family structures into the units that they need for their own governance. So family and state, very important sets of uh, dynamics to be examined. Other sets of dynamics, very important to understanding family uh, structures and dynamics, are the relationships between fathers, sons, and states. Uh, if you observe the uh, dynamics of the Arab Spring, or the Arab uprisings, or the Arab revolutions, whatever you want to call them, and if you followed the fate of the political leaders of those states, you could not help uh, noticing the centrality of families to the way the, uh, the, the, uh, the Libya, uh, Egypt, um, uh, Syria, and uh, Iraq uh, uh, reacted during that period of time. In Libya, for example, destroying the regime was not only about bringing down Muammar al-Qaddafi, the Libyan revolutions had to bring down his sons. And they went on a hunt until they had tracked them all. They especially, they, uh, they killed three of them right off, but especially they were after Saif al-Islam, his son, because he was the heir apparent. So it's not enough to bring down a leader to just kill that leader, you've got to kill his sons. Why? Because the assumption of that family connection toward leadership. Saddam Hussein's ouster was not complete without the killing of his sons, Uday and Qusay. Qusay was the heir apparent. And they apparently were trying to negotiate their surrender, but the, the, uh, the air attackers were having none of it. They had to make sure they were not alive to continue that re regime. When uh, Zayn al abdin Ibn Ali fled Tunisia in 2001 after the Arab uprisings there, uh, large numbers of his family were arrested. They were all charged with corruption, which was probably an accurate uh, uh, charge because they were known as the mafia. But it wasn't enough that he left they had to go after the family. Syria changed the constitution uh, after the death of Hafez al-Assad in 2000 so that his son Bashar could take over because he was too young at that time. So they changed the age just enough to let him become pre uh, president. Um, and we talk, when you talk about uh, 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 Bashar al-Assad's uh, 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 regime in Syria, you have to talk about his brother, and you have to talk about his, his uh, sister Bushra's husband. Uh, you, you talk about his, his family connections with the, with the Alawite, uh, etc. Hosni Mubarak was clearly grooming his son Gamal uh, Mubarak to inherit his position as head of the Egyptian state. And maybe, maybe Mubarak saved the lives of his sons by stepping down rather than uh, waiting for the uprisings to, uh, to uh, have at him. This is not only uh, uh, Egypt or Libya or Tunisia or Syria. Uh, you find it throughout. For example, in Lebanon, fathers have continually succeeded their sons in positions of power in the state. The Shum those who know the history of Lebanon, the Shimuns, the Jmayas, the Khouris, the Hariris, the Jumblas, the Al Khazans, the Sulaimans, the Sulhs, the Kar Karamis. Father succeeded son, succeeded uh, son into positions of power. 
If the leadership in so many of these Arab states has descended father to the son, then one, one might wonder whether the Arab uprisings of 2011 might be regarded as the fall of the fathers. Did we finally bring down the, the fathers uh, in Tunisia, in Iraq, in Egypt, in Libya, uh, in Yemen? Uh, the, the fathers were brought down. They all considered themselves as uh, head, of the, uh, head of the national family. They talked about the citizens as their children. Uh, they expected obedience to themselves, ta'a in Arabic, just as a father would expect obedience to him. And sometimes I thought that the, they acted, uh, for those of you, how many of you know the Egyptian uh, Nobel Prize winning author, Naguib al-Mahfouz? Yeah. How many of you know his book, uh, Palace Walk? Okay, uh, the Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, trilogy that he wrote. Well, if you remember Ahmed Abdel Jawad, the key character in uh, 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 Palace Walk, and actually in the, in the trilogy, had a wife who adored him, uh, sons who wanted to be like him, and daughters who measured their suitors by their father's yardstick. I think in many ways, each of these leaders that we saw wanted to be Abdel Jawad, uh, Ahmed Abdel Jawad, who while he maintained this strict uh, uh, sanctity of the household had a, do, had a nightlife to be envied uh, by any of these leaders. I think in some ways they wanted to be the patriarch of Naguib Mahfouz's imagination. It didn't quite work out in the end for them that way. Uh, at the same time, at the same time as we see these kinds of uh, dynamics, Arab states have tried to mark their modernity through the iconic representation of Arab women as modern. Uh, and we see this, uh, it's been you know, a century of women's movements, feminist movements in the region, and often and very often with male uh, protagonists as their, as their advocates. It was very interesting that in Yemen in 2011, during the Arab uprisings, a group of women burned their veils uh, in protest over President Ali Salah's refusal to address the protesters. And the Swedish Academy awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to Tawakkal uh, Karama of Yemen, I think partly in recognition of the role of, of uh, women in those Arab uprisings. Um, so a, a number of other issues related to Arab families, the role of the states in, in constructing nationality laws uh, are, uh, are, uh, are central. Uh, so let, that brings us to the subject of family, religion, and law. Uh, that comes up as a theme throughout these articles, throughout these chapters, country by country. In so many of the Arab countries, family law, which regulates marriage, uh, inheritance, and child custody, is mediated through religious law. And as a result, you have, in many countries, a diversity of law within family law within the same country <clears throat> because of the adherence to different religious laws. This virtual embedding of family and, uh, family and the sacred, if you think of the religion as the sacred, has made family law among the most difficult law, areas of law to change. Um, and we see this throughout uh, the reviews of, the, uh, uh, of legal history. Uh, it's, and I would add that it's not an accident that uh, uh, Muslim political activists in the region have targeted the family as a primary uh, uh, site for their intervention in, in state politics. Many of, these, many of the movements gained their political legitimacy and political power uh, on the basis of uh, their stance on family law and on, uh, and on women. Uh, interestingly, when the Muslim Brotherhood came into power in 2012 for that short period of time in Egypt, uh, they were trying to change family law. Um, uh, <clears throat> I've got a number of examples here uh, that I won't go into. Uh, but the, 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 the strong embedding of, of, uh, of re law, family law, um, in religion makes religion a state actor in those, uh, uh, because they have legal uh, uh, authority over religious law. So it's, again, it's not an accident that the main alternative to the family as a site of mobilization uh, for sentiment or action at this historical moment uh, appears to be religious movements. Uh, in your seminar this afternoon, we were talking about the, what was called the youth bulge. Two thirds of the population of many of the Arab countries are 29 years old or younger. In this country, that same population is about 23% as opposed to 60, uh, 65, uh, 60 to 65%. In other words, we are just the opposite. Our elderly are getting bigger 
uh, and our youth population is shrinking. Over there, the, the youth population is bulging uh, um, at a time when, in fact, many of the leaders of those countries are elderly. At the time he, st he stepped down from his position in uh, Egypt, Mubarak was 82 years old, yet two-thirds of his population was 29 years old or younger. So look at that a disparity. The, but the, the, uh, and it's food for these alternative movements, whether they're religious movements, which are the ones that have become the, the most powerful, or other kind of movements to find a sanctuary, uh, or to find, uh, sorry, uh, um, ready, willing um, uh, uh, recruits. And I just want to make a couple of points about family and technology. Uh, because technology is something you think of as something outside of the state, but in fact the state is so central to the development of, of technology, uh, whether it's bus systems or electricity uh, or even the regulation of, of social media. Uh, during the uh, uh, uprisings, uh, the Egyptian, in 2011, the Egyptian uh, government tried very much to shut down Facebook because Facebook was so critical in bringing people out to the streets. Uh, Skype has just been set, shut down in Egypt. Um, journalists are frequently arrested, uh, actually stepping out of the Arab countries a bit. But in t uh, Turkey has the, uh, has the unfortunate reputation of being the country with the largest number of journalists prisoners uh, in the world. Uh, uh, um, so technology, the media, is, is something that is not outside of the state. It is very often regulated by the state. Uh, but it is something that has become very, very, very important, especially Facebook has become very important in the, in the region, uh, in, in a region that is, uh, with, which is now highly transis, uh, transitory. Uh, during the war in Lebanon, for example, over 200,000 people were killed. About a quarter of the Lebanese population migrated, left Lebanon. Many of them have returned. The war was from 1975 to 19. Uh, 90. In Syria now we have the largest cr uh, crisis of, of, of displacement and refugees since World War II, largely triggered by the, uh, the upheaval in Syria where anywhere, depending on the calculations, depending on the, which database you use, anywhere from uh, a, a third to half the population has been displaced. Uh, two million of them have, have come to Lebanon, another couple of million in Turkey, about a million end up in Germany, and Jordan has uh, an, an equivalent amount. Uh, so how do people stay in touch with each other? You've got a phenomenon now of transnational families that was not caused by the uprising by any means. It preceded it by centuries, if you will, because migration in that region has always been uh, central to sur economic survival. But we have a different kind of technology today available to those transnational families, and it's, it's things like, like uh, Facebook. Family, I, I, the village I was doing, uh, am still doing my longitudinal study, ended up losing half of the, the group of, of people that I was working with, half the families, and they ended up either in Ottawa or in uh, Newark, New Jersey. So I followed them there. And what I learned is that they are extremely closely connected with their families. They're on Facebook every day, several times a day. Uh, one of the women I interviewed in Ottawa said she knows more about her sister now than she did when she was in Lebanon because she knows every time her sister goes to the doctor, she knows every time she knows what they have for breakfast, she knows every, every playground that her sister takes uh, their, uh, her niece to. So they're very, very connected. It's a, it's a different world of, of family relationships because of the, of the technology that is available uh, today. So we have something that we now can call transnational families, multi-sided uh, families that are uh, um, uh, uh, in some ways a risk to the state. And states are very aware of this and in fact trying to regulate it. Uh, in, in, in different ways. So why, again, why study families, to bring it back full circle? Well, I, I think one of the reasons is that we simply want to know how these societies are organized. We need to know, understand the social relationships. We need to understand uh, the, the dynamics that lead people into certain kinds of, uh, of uh, politics or certain kinds of jobs or, or certain um, movements. Why do they go from one, to, why do they leave? Why do they uh, move around? But as importantly, we, we need better policy making. Uh, we, we have for, for, for too long, I think, scholars are reluctant to work with state actors for very good reasons. Uh, but as a result, our scholarship goes, is often not used as effectively as it could be. 
Uh, we sometimes we're even reluctant to uh, to, to work with NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, and again, often for very good reasons. But it's clear that this is an area that is desperate for better, better policy making, and to have better policy making, you have to have research. And there couldn't be an area of research that is more important for understanding what's going on in those countries today than studying Arab families, because it is a microcosm that uh, tells us what's going on in the economy, in politics, in in religion, and in global labor movements. So I would direct your attention to families and encourage those of you who are out there, graduate students or undergraduates, and I see some of you from the seminar this afternoon, go study families. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So now, Q&A, and don't ask me any question about what's on the board. Yes, please say your name so we get to know you. My name is Asla. Say it again. Asla. Asla. Uh, Turkish name. In Arabic, that would mean origin. This is neat. In Urdu, in Hindu, in, in Arabic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so You're it. You're the origin. <laughs> um, thank you for this presentation. I want to uh, actually contribute to your discussion on the definition of family as a contest of zone and yeah. just how we can just contest the form itself. And I'm yeah. more interested in the people, subjects who lie at the margins of this that are reproductive family actually, mm -hmm. which goes to the, uh, out your presentation. So mm -hmm. there is also some dominant definition of family as a reproductive model. That's right. Um, so I'm wondering um, how you would approach, or maybe you're approaching in the in the larger book mm -hmm. about like how people who are pushed to margins of this family definition, how, how they also use family creatively to survive, or they how they. Uh, the kind of friendship, alternative community yeah. as family. So are you also dealing with these alternative definitions of family? Uh, is it, do you find it useful or are we uh, reproducing maybe another dominant model of intimacy by replicating uh, this, this connection? So I'm, I just want to hear yeah. about your thoughts on this. Yeah, very, no, very important question. Uh, what what I'm, I, I hope I conveyed is that there isn't a model of family, so that there isn't we can't say an alternative because alternative assumes that there is a, a dominant uh, model. And I've tried very hard to argue that there's a diversity of models. Uh, so that doesn't answer the genuine question you have, which is what about the heteronormativity and and uh, families that get created outside of that paradigm. There is research that's emerging now. It's not my research, but there is research that's er emerging now, especially in Lebanon. And, and what's fascinating about the work that's being done in Lebanon is that th uh, some of those groups are doing their own research. They're producing their own theories. They're producing their own analyses. But I, well, I thought it was very interesting. I talked to a, a network of, uh, of women who uh, see themselves in, in some ways as creating alternative, if you want to use that word, alternatives. Um, and this was just before uh, the uh, 2011, uh, and there was, there was uh, s uh, some crackdowns, and they had to uh, uh, they had to figure out for themselves where did they go, where did they feel secure, where did they feel that they had uh, protections. It was interesting. Many of them went back to their quote families, so they're doing both. I don't think they abandon the families necessarily, but they're they're self consciously producing their own constructs, their own literature, their own scholarship, uh, and there's even publications. Zaina, do you want to talk about it a little bit? Because you're, you've done more research on this. Dr. Zaina Zatari, who's actually done some research on this. Do you want to address? <laughs> sure, uh, yes, I mean. She knows a whole lot more than I do. <laughs> uh, it's partly one of the, my research projects that I'm working on, uh, in particular at Lebanon, looking at how um, uh, non-normative um, in terms of gender and sexual identities, um, individuals, particularly women and um, uh, trans men, um, create possibly alternative kinds of, of families as a way or a strategy to, um, you know, uh, uh, be able to maneuver at this this space. But as you know, what we heard from uh, Professor Joseph that the the formulations of, of family in their diversity are extremely dominant and strong, um, in large part in Lebanon because the state has been, you know, utter fa failure in terms of uh, uh, access to rights or other kind of resources. So 
it, it is almost impossible for people to feel that they can exist outside of their sort of traditional families, the families they're born into. Um, and so they're continuously trying to maneuver that, that space. And some do it by creating chosen families or you know, alternative families, um, while also straddling a space where they try to find ways to maintain their positionalities within their own families. And that leads to a number of, you know, a range of things from frustrations, uh, from living double lives, from, you know, a constant state of negotiation um, in many ways. That, that is the difficult and burdensome for, for the most part. Um, I mean, I'm, my research is not concluded, so it's still kind of in process, but I, I do I did appreciate your question because I think even when we talk about the diversity of families, we are still um, talking about largely heteronormative uh, families that do everything they can in the diversity of these kind of inter-family dynamics to, to reinstitute um, very dominant notions of womanhood, manhood for the purposes of marriage and population because the state does not recognize us as individuals, it sees us as members of family. And so if we are not members of the family, then we're nowhere. Uh, the state doesn't know how to address us and interact with us. So I think, I think part of the answer is it's not either or. It is an, it's not an either or. It's not you're either an alternative or this, I, I, I think, both both affection and genuine commitment and love keeps them connected, but also necessity. Uh, based on our research in, in Lebanon, as I said, uh, Dr. Zatari knows more about this than I do, but I, I, I think uh, that um, we're going to see more scholarship, and I think it's going to be produced by those groups themselves, about themselves, and that's a very, very exciting frontier. Yes. Yes, Can you so tell us your name again? So yes. I'm not an anthropology good. <laughs> I'm a pediatrician. Um, my name is Iman Ansari, and I'm from that part of the world, and I'm fascinated by, by your research and your presentation. What I'm understanding is that it's mostly descriptive so far. We're trying to understand what's happening and how is the family is playing a role in the political developments over there. Families make the politicians, and also families are what's making the, the uh, citizens, population, etc. However, my question to you is, are we going to also compare that to the successes of Europe and the US in moving beyond this family units and making the state and trying to present that information in the Middle East to show them maybe a possible pathway out of where they are right now politically? Very interesting question, especially the way you phrased, uh, uh, phrased it at the end. Uh, I've spent a lifetime uh, talking with women in the region and uh, because I have my own commitment to my own family, who I adore, um, and, and at the same time a, a, a deep feminist critique of family systems, both here and, and, and around the world. And I ask my feminist colleagues who I would have in, in Lebanon, in Egypt, Palestine, the countries that I work in, um, would they give up their own families? to have the kind of families that they see here in America, and to a person they always say no. In other words, they don't see this as progress. They don't see this as a better way of having a family system. And that could be partly their image, but partly the reality of alienation. Uh, you know, the drug problems here is far more than drug problems there. Suicides here is much greater, teen, teen suicide especially, much higher here than it is there. there there's a lot of problems for us to recognize. As, uh, uh, so I'm not sure that showing them a pathway that is a European pathway is a solution to whatever they're addressing. What I would in fact call for is us looking at the European and American pathway to see how it is we've got here to, to a point where uh, that uh, I think many uh, rightly are concerned about youth, and, and uh, young people, with, with all of the, free, I, I would not, I'm not saying let's give away the freedoms and the rights and so forth that have been achieved, which are wonderful successes to, to use your, your word. I would you know, um, uh, agree 100% with you on that. But things were also lost along the way. And 
that's what many of my colleagues in the region look at when they see that. They see things lost along the way, and they wouldn't trade. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't problems, but it's to say that I think that this is not necessarily a model for that. We have to, they have to find. We can't do it for them. But what we can do as scholars is to provide data, to provide the research, to provide um, uh, analysis and theories that are appropriate to that region. And that is much harder than it seems, because most of us who are doing research there have been trained here, including the people who are there doing research. Most of them have been trained in Europe or the United States, overwhelmingly. So to develop constructs and concepts that are appropriate and relevant to the region is itself an undertaking. I'm now uh, co-PIing a project on transforming mental health treatment for refugees and vulnerable populations in Egypt, Lebanon, and Palestine. Huge refugee problems in those areas. What do we do? Do we take the notion of trauma from here and apply it there? Or is there a different notion of trauma there? Do we take the notions of how you heal here and apply it there? Are there different notions of healing here? Do we take notions of autonomy and independence and the individual here and apply it there? Or, and what we've, uh, we've been working now for a solid year is simply developing the framework. And what I hear repeatedly from our colleagues in Egypt, Lebanon, and Palestine, who are themselves trained in psychology and have been working with mental health issues, you cannot bring those concepts with you here because they're not going to apply here because here it's not the individual but it's the whole family and the community that we have to treat so it's it's, it's a fascinating undertaking where we have to constantly be that's why I started by clarifying concepts where we have to constantly be aware of the language that we use and the concepts that we transport with us sometimes inadvertently yeah, take with us uh, because we're so you know we naturalize them we, we think that of course a smile is a smile every place in the world. A, a laugh is a laugh everywhere in the, in the world until you find out it isn't. You know? So, that, that, so that, that I think that's the kind of trajectory that I have found uh, really engaging, very difficult, much longer term. You've got to really make a commitment because you've got to work on the ground with the people there that, uh, who are themselves trying to grapple uh, with their own realities. Uh, but in the long run, I think maybe more exciting and uh, revelatory of the complexities of the human condition and its enor enormous diversity. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's go to here, this, room, this side of the room, and then we'll switch sides of the room. Yeah. Um, so I want to push you to give me a view. This is the question that I've been struggling to find an answer to. And it's somewhat related to what I study, which is, um, which is, uh, which is Armenians in post-genocide Turkey, a group for which family and the re recovery of the union of the family is existentially related to this group survival. Um, so the question is, is there a way, either what I, I'm curious about what you think about this, but also what your colleagues or the people that, like feminist scholars specifically, in the region that you talked to, who would not exchange their families with the kind of families that they are thinking about um, if, if there's a way of keeping the good parts of the patriarchal family. Like, because the family, even though it is the Arab family, or in general the unit of family in its most mainstream conventional understanding, it is heteronormative, reproductive, and patriarchal. <coughs> it is hierarchical, and right? Like, but it also gives us connectivity, something, uh, security, dependence, interdependability, which is one of the reasons, I guess, you mentioned that reduces suicide rates, mental health maybe is less of an issue in the region, or the way it's defined, I know it's different. But it's, on one hand, it's a good thing. Despite the fact that it's matter, can we have that, but also equality, freedom, mm -hmm. rights, um, non-hierarchical conception of the unit itself, and equal representation of the unit? So is there a way of having both? If I had that answer, I think it was all these I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's a dilemma I personally, yeah. uh, uh, you know, um, struggle with. It's a, a dilemma that <clears throat> all my colleagues and good friends 
in Lebanon, Egypt, Palestine who are feminists struggle with. They would not give up their families. That doesn't mean that they don't have problems. That doesn't mean they're not aware of the hierarchy and, the in and inequality within the families. <clears throat> and I think uh, um, there, a, a, a situation which is not precisely the the Armenian situation, but I think is a, a genocide at another level, the Palestinian situation, where in fact family is also being uh, re reinforced to a, a, a huge degree because that's one way they can remain Palestinian, but also what gets reinforced within that is inequality and gender hierarchy and so forth. So it's, it, I think when there's trauma of that sort, when, when there's been a, a genocide to a people, what do they hold on to? What did they, and it's not surprising that family would be something that they would hold on to, but it brings with it, as you said, uh, th these uh, dilemmas of inequality and hierarchy. Can we have both? I would hope so. If I didn't think that that, that was possible, I think I would just hang myself and, and, and disappear. I'd have to believe that. I have to believe it's possible. I, I, I don't think you can commit yourself to a feminist notion of social justice without believing that that becomes possible. But when... And keeping the notion of family, you could also get rid of it, you know, and negate the rejected as in the I, you know, as I began by saying the term family itself doesn't cover all the social arrangements that we're talking about in the region. I'm not committed to the concept of family. I'm committed to connectivity. I'm committed to compassion. I'm committed to love in its, in its many, many forms. Uh, does it have to be called family? You know, it can be called many, many things. But can you have commitment, compassion, loyalty, love, without its being uh, um, organized around inequality and hierarchy? I have to believe that it can happen. I have to believe. Literally, if I didn't believe that, I didn't know how I would wake up in the morning. I have to believe that that's socially possible. And I, I think most of us who commit to progressive social movements or commit, commit to feminist principles believe that. That's why we do what we do. Right? I mean, that's why you're committed to the project you're working on and these Armenian women in the 19th century and the 20th century who, who worked so hard for a feminist uh, a vision, right? They haven't resolved it, though. They haven't resolved it, but, you know, democracy isn't resolved either, right? Look what's happening to us. <laughs> So, uh, but you've got to believe it's possible. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's never possible. But if we don't believe, how do we ever get there? How do we ever know? So uh, I'm a fool for belief. I, I, I have to believe. Let's see, I haven't, we haven't had anything on this side of the room, and then I'll come back over here. Yes? Related to the question that were um, raised before, so I actually believe that focusing on the concept of family rather than ignoring this um, the most feminist thing we, we can do yes. as you argued and show um, family is very central to our understanding. Um, okay, so as an in immigrant myself in the US, I know how uh, I know the difference of like family structure in Turkey and Armenian family versus here. But I also, and I sense it in my life, my experience, but I also feel like that comparison that you brought up, the Middle Eastern feminists not wanting to do up or looking at the Western um, stereotype of feminism, uh, family as, no, this is not what we want, is also very historical. Like, we are working on 19th century Armenian feminists. The first thing that the, they, the, the way they want to, what is too much feminism, what differentiates them from the Western feminists is the family. Right. Family, family, family. So family defines the Armenian feminism. Yeah. But I also think that it's, uh, as you said, it's an image and it's a stereotype. And um, it's an important thing to, like, feminist historians should, should also deconstruct the way that image was also contributed. Because what I'm reminded of is the, like, black feminists in terms of thinking about family in a different way. And I feel like people like Bell Hooks were already, like, resolving this issue. And I was actually watching a very interesting video the other day about um, an African American feminist um, arguing against some um, conservative black men uh, who say that feminism is destroying the black family. So there is already this discussion. So we have a similar discussion uh, in the Armenian case. Mm -hmm. So what I want to ask is uh, going back to 
Oscars actually comment that like as feminists, if we um, you said like connectivity, detachment, uh, attachment, and all this kind of like affection, if this is our definition of family. Uh, where can we find it in uh, anthropological or historical research? Like, have you come across um, any alternative forms of family in history? For example, we know in Ottoman history that there were harems that were like ex uh, women from released from the harem. They formed uh, like households. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like Ottoman households, they were. I'm also asking this question because I want to understand if you because you beautifully like formulated the family as a matter of state. Mm -hmm. So like is is family a product of nation state? If it is so then looking back to history and looking for alternative uh, households, can it help us to like enlarge and broaden and to incorporate like queer families or you know, there's if you look historically cross culture is there. So 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 infinite kinds of social arrangements, uh, especially in pre-state societies. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and and the, in fact, the, the term family is, would be very inappropriate to even apply to those uh, uh, pre-state societies. And so they, they tend to be talked about as kinship units rather than families. And what is striking about them is their fluidity. People go in and out of residence or co-residence. <clears throat> and that, and what happens with the state, I think this is why, for me, the, the state is uh, so critical in understanding family systems, is that states try to stabilize the units that are under them for purposes of governance. They try to, and the more consolidated the state, the more centralized the state, the more they try to uh, stabilize. Uh, the fact that we didn't have family names. Family names are relatively recent, uh, other than for the elite, other than for the elite, family names are relatively 20th century phenomena. Most people who are not elite uh, uh, didn't have a stable family name. Why did we stabilize family names? Why did we insist that that uh, you know we have a, a family called Joseph? So, globally, because in most areas of the world, you were either known from the village that you were from, or that you were the son of so and so, or you were, you were part of a a larger. Uh, tribal group or whatever you want to call it. I don't like the word tribe, but for better reference. But in the uh, late 19th century, but especially in the early 20th century, there was a systematic effort around the world to stabilize family names. Why? Taxation and military conscription. And there's actually, for those, anybody here from Iran? There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful uh, uh, article by uh, Hushan Shahabi, you know, that, and he talks about how in the 1920s, the Shah insisted that everyone choose a family name because they, they, had, they were the son of, the son of, the son of, and so forth. And so, they, uh, in fact, his article is hilarious. He talks about how people would announce in a newspaper, from now on, I am going to be known as such and such, and no one else is to use this name because they had to identify uh, their names. Our family, there's no family Joseph in Lebanon. That, there is no such family as Joseph in Lebanon. Joseph was my grandfather's first name, Yusuf. Yusuf translates as Joseph. So when the immigration officials uh, were, when my father came to this country right after World War I, and they wanted to write down his name, and they asked him what's his name, he said, Salim ibn Yusuf. And so he became Samuel Joseph. They just translated it. You go back to Lebanon, and who are your relatives? There's no Joseph there. But we do have lots of family, but it was a, it, it's a different name. And, and most of the names of the immigrants from that area of the world, if you look, if you follow them, their first names, because they were the son of, the son of, the son of. Uh, but that is a process that took, that took place uh, around the world, stabilizing. Why was that stabilization necessary? I would argue it's the state. The state needs to know who, is in, who its citizens are. It needs, to, uh, it needs to govern. It needs to tax. It needs to strip people for the military. And it needs to know how to do that. It needs, the, the whole idea of, of statistics, the word statistics, statistics come from, from state. The state needed metrics in order for, uh, to have governance. And among the things that they, they govern, they, that among the metrics that they need is population. You know, how, who, who lives here? What are they doing? How much money are they making? How many children do they have? Uh, how much food are they consuming? How much are they producing in the marketplace? So, the states 
have to stabilize. They have to, they have to institutionalize. And the, the stronger the state, the more centralized the state, the more it's going to institutionalize. So, uh, so families become more fixed. Uh, and we, we have far less fluidity at one level. On the other hand, we have much more fluidity, the, the, point, the question that you, you are raising here. So it's that complex reality that I'm trying to keep hold in one hand. I, I'm, I'm not willing to say this is the Arab family when I know that there's a gazillion other things and try to hold that all and yet still be able to speak about it, to still, still have a language, to still have uh, um, the, the possibility for theory. It's, it's, a, a, a much, it's much easier to say, this is the Arab family, and here's, I'm going to explain it. Much, much easier. And we've all done that, right? And we've all read books like that. This is a much harder route, is to allow the complexity to be alive within your own analysis. But I think it's much richer. And I think it's, it's, it's a deeper connection to the reality of the diversity of humanity. Uh, it's who we are, that we will not be institutionalized. We will not be conscripted into being just one thing. We are many, many things. Uh, and so that's the challenge of the scholar, is to, is to recognize that diversity, as we were talking in the seminar earlier today, is to recognize that diversity and not only allow for it, but to understand it and to recognize that it is prominent in the lives that we live. And I, for me, but one place to begin in understanding that complexity and diversity and to really nuance uh, humanity, human relationships, is to start with this, this animal, this elephant that we call the family. Back there, and then we'll come back here again. Tell us your name. My name is Gina. Um, I'm actually a PhD student in biology, biology department, but um, I'm here because I saw the flyers and I was very interested in the topic. Um, uh, my question is regarding the Arab family in America. For instance, um, uh, parents who moved from Arab countries and are kind of raising children in America. So my parents were born in Mosul, and they're Christian. <laughs> and so I have two older sisters, and so we were raised in this traditional Arab uh, household, but there was a lot of conflict because my parents also wanted us to be American. But that was like black and white, you know. And so we were raised in this very strange way um, and I feel some sort of um, almost like a guilt that I know that the traditional Arab family for my lineage ends with, with me and with my generation because there's no way we're going to, you know, have five generations in one house like my parents, you know, used to live with. Um, but also you mentioned that the family that you were studying, um, they keep in touch with via Facebook and that actually is a very effective way. I'm wondering, do you, th how common do you think that is? Because for instance, my parents are very private and I always thought that privacy and also image upkeep was very important in the Arab family. So um, those are sort of not really in line with Facebook, right? This public sharing of information, all these photos, what you're doing, you know, who you're dating and things like that. So how, how do you reconcile those two things? Let me back up a little bit to, to respond to what you, where you started, which is you know, how do we, that you're the last in the line. You know, every generation is the last in the line because there isn't a thing that has been stable that has stayed in a particular way. Each generation romanticizes where they came from, and then their children are the last in the line. And uh, I just don't think it ever was. I think it always was changing, and that's part of what I'm trying to uh, get at, is how do we recognize that complexity and hold it in the same hand? Um, so uh, don't worry about it. It always was changing. Your, your grandparents probably complained about what their parents, what your parents did and so forth. Um, I think this is just life. It's just the reality. But uh, and and, uh, and by the way, I'm I'm just finishing a book that is it was actually Michael Suleiman's book, and he asked me to finish it up for him before he passed away. That is about Arab American uh, women, and and there's a number of articles on family there. It will be coming out with Syracuse University Press hopefully next year. Um, so there's there's a whole new field, by the way, on Arab American studies, and there is a uh, an organization now. Uh, that is for Arab American Studies. I happen to be one of the co-founders of it. We have a conference every third year 
at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. So there's lots of literature uh, now in that field. But in terms of Facebook, I, I think it's as variable here as it is, uh, as variable there as it is here. We had a wonderful conversation in the seminar this afternoon, and, uh, and everybody in the seminar was saying that their families used, some of them have Facebook, some of them don't. Some of their families, uh, uh, the father does, but the mother doesn't. And it's, it's quite variable, right? Well, there wasn't one, one way in which Facebook was being used. And even among the classmates themselves, some of them didn't, there was at least one person who said, I don't have Facebook, I'm never going to use Facebook. So I think it's quite variable there. But what we have that is really quite important there is the, is the technology gap, where uh, the, you know, there's a, a huge, uh, I mean, the, 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 the poverty line is very high. But you know what? A third of the country, a third of the United States lives under the poverty line. Poverty is huge in this country, too. We've got something like, uh, um, what, what, what was the figure? Uh, over 30 million people in this country live below the poverty line, and something, if you, uh, th uh, sorry, 30% uh, of, the, of the population in this country live at or below the poverty line, and if you include how many are near the poverty line, it's 50%. So there's a technology gap in this country, too. However, having said that, it always amazes me how many people have cell phones. Everywhere I go, everybody has a cell phone. They can't afford anything else, but they've got a cell phone. And guess what you can do with a cell phone? You can download all kinds of apps, which is why the 2011 uprising was so success successful, because cell phones were all over the place. And that's why the, if you followed the 2009 elections in Iran, that was kind of basically uh, uh, you know, um, controlled by the, the clergy, and there was a massive uprising. How did that massive uprising take place? Facebook. But then what did the Iranian government do? They shut it down. What did people do? They shouted from rooftop to rooftop. I mean, and that's, that's what I love about the human spirit. You can't keep it down. But uh, I, I, think, I, I think Facebook is, I, I, I don't know what I think about Facebook. Let me put it that way. Uh, um, it's, it's very complicated. Uh, uh, throughout the region, there, uh, uh, Facebook is very, very popular. People are connecting with each other. Transnational families are connecting with each other. But as you said, you know, there, there are those for whom this is a violation of intimacy and privacy. Uh, I, I think we won't know what Facebook is for another generation. I think we'll look back to what we're in the midst of now and understand it better. And that actually connects to uh, a point uh, that uh, uh, you were making a little bit earlier that I wanted to comment on, which is that you can't always know the period that you're in. You, uh, that's why we have historians. I think there are several historians uh, among us. You, you can't always know. And, and so in some sense, the endeavor of anthropology, which is my uh, discipline, has to always be interlaced with history. Uh, we, we are, uh, what I feel as a scholar, the struggle always is, is to get at the edge of where we are so that I can take a, you know, turn a little bit and look at it. But that struggle to get at the edge of where we are so that I can genuinely see where we, uh, what, what is it, this world that we live in? What is it, this life that we're living? What is this historical moment that is happening uh, to us? Is an, it, it's a, it, it's I don't know how else to describe it other than it's a struggle because you're, you're working continually to get outside of the categories that are mandated. You're working continually to get outside of the, of the concepts that seem to be naturalized and everyone else believes that, that that just is. And you're continually questioning, why do we look at things this way? Why am I using this word? Why do I assume that this is the way it is or should be? If you're constantly questioning, it's exhausting. <laughs> and, but it's so, so rewarding. And those, those little brief moments, and I, and I assure you, it's very brief, brief, when I feel like I've gotten to an edge and I can look and I say, oh my God, is this what we're living? Is this what it's all about? And then it goes away. <laughs> come back, come back. It's a struggle. But I, I really believe that we can't very well know. We can try the best we can. And that's what sociology does. That's what anthropology does. That's what all the contemporary the, uh, so the social sciences of contemporary life do. That's what artists do. Maybe the artists know better than we do, or the poets tell us better than we can know. Uh, but ultimately, it's up to history, decades hence, to tell us what we were long after we were it. 
I think we had a question over here, and maybe we're getting near the time. You tell me. She had her hand up for a while. Okay. Okay, then that's it. Thank you all very much for coming. I really enjoyed your being here. Thank you. Thank you.